So number one tells us that polygon Q is a scaled copy of polygon P. So I've kind of highlighted in color so you can see which one is the original. So blue is the original. And then Q is the scaled copy. And in part A here, it tells us that we know that the value of X is 6. So we know this side is 6. What is the value of Y? And so you can kind of figure out the scale factor first if you wanted to. What do we multiply this blue shape P by to get Q? And to do that, you just look at corresponding sides that have lengths that are given to you. So this four, its corresponding side in the scaled image is three. And so we can figure out the scale factor by taking the new number divided by the original number. So our new number is three, our original number is four. So that means that this orange shape is three fourths of the size of P and we can see that it's getting smaller. So it would make sense that the K value is smaller than one. And so that means anything I multiply in the original figure um, by three fourths, I'll get the new one. So if I do four times three fourths, that gives me three. And so we can use that idea to figure out the value of Y. So we can do six times the scale factor of three fourths. And that's gonna give us 18 over four, um, which is nine over two if we wanted it simplified as a fraction or as a decimal would be 4.5. All right, then in number two, we again have a scaled um, copy here. So F is the scaled copy of E. And so we can see that that image is getting smaller than they told us a bunch of different information that we know. And so we know that this segment here, AB is six, and we know that CD is three. So I'm just gonna make those purple in that shape. And then in the scaled copy, we know that X, Y is four, and we also know that Z, W is A. So they didn't give us an actual length for that. And so now it asks us to select all of the true equations. So you kind of just have to follow a pattern here. So let's take a look at what this first one does. So this first one had us look at um, six compared to three. So this kind of horizontal segment divided by this vertical segment in this first shape. Then it said, so six divided by three is the same as four divided by A. That's gonna be true because we compared corresponding parts. So we went horizontal divided by vertical in the original and then horizontal divided by vertical in our scale. So that is gonna create a true proportion. Um, so then in this next one, and let me just get these out of here. So the next proportion says six over four. So now we're comparing the horizontal in the original to the horizontal in the scaled. And then they said equals three over A. So you can see when I put these arrows on, I'm saying comparing horizontal to horizontal and then vertical to vertical. And they're following a pattern so this is going to be another true proportion. And once you have a true proportion, you can kind of look at the cross products as well. So if we look at this first one, we say 6 over 3 and we say 4 over A. So if these diagonals um, or these cross products end up being the same number, so 6 and A on that one, and then 4 and 3 on this one, if we see that, we'll have a true proportion. So in B, we see that we still have um, six and A along this diagonal, and we still have four and three along that diagonal. So that's gonna be good. So that's another strategy. Um, all right, then let's take a look at the rest. So um, for part C, it says three over four. So now they're taking um, the vertical segment 
and comparing it to the horizontal in the other figure. So you can't do that where you're comparing a non-corresponding part in different figures. So this one just starts bad. Um, and you could look at the cross products here again, and you could see that it has um, four and six on this on the diagonal, okay? And four and six don't go together. Six goes with A, four goes with three. So this one's going to be um, bad. D asks us to compare six to three. And we can do that because it's within the same shape. So we're comparing horizontal to vertical. Then we just have to do the same thing in the other. So six to three. Now they did A to four. So now they flipped that around and went vertical to horizontal. So that one's going to be bad. We can again see that on the diagonal that they put that the wrong numbers are on the diagonal. E um, does six to four which is fine. We can compare horizontal in both shapes. So we're doing horizontal to horizontal. So six to four. Now they went A to three. They went backwards. Okay. So that's the wrong um, order. Final one. Um, they did three compared to four. And that's comparing again the vertical in one to the horizontal in the other. So that one starts out bad. All right, number three has us solving some proportions. So we're going to do um, cross products here, cross multiplication. Um, you can also do some other skills here. So I'll show you a couple different ways. Um, so in this one, you can do two times um, 15. So that's going to be 30. And I'm just going to write it out for you, two times 15. And then on this side, um, multiplying five times X. So then you would be getting 30 equals 5x, and then you could divide by 5, and you would get 6 equals x for this first one. Another way you could have looked at that same problem, so we have 2 over 5 equals x over 15. You could notice that um, on the bottom here, 5 times 3 gives us 15. So we could apply the same idea to the top and multiply the top by three. So two times three would give us the top over here of six. So that's another way you could have looked at that one. All right, then let's look at B. Um, so I'm just gonna write it over here. So we've got four over three equals X over seven. Now, not, not a nice number does not take three times something to get seven. So we probably can't really use this strategy as well, um, but we can cross multiply. So seven times four is 28. And then we've got three times X. And then we can divide both sides by three. And when we do 28 divided by three, we get that X equals 9.3 repeating. And so you can just put 9.3 or 9.3 with that little bar over it. All right, then um, C. So again, now this one does have some nice numbers up here with seven. I'm just going to write it again. Seven over five equals 28 over X. So we can see um, on this top one here, seven times four gives us 28. So we could use that idea for the bottom and do five times four. And then we would get X equals 20. So you could do that. Um, or you could cross multiply. <clears throat> so if you cross multiply, you're getting X times seven and then five times um, 28 is 140. And then you could divide by seven and get X equals 20. So either way is fine. And then um, final one here. So we can do X times 11 is 11 X. And then four times five is 20. Divide both sides by 11. And we would get X equals 1.818181 repeating. Um, so if you wanted to round that to the nearest hundredth, you'd get 1.82.
All right, number four asks us select a shape that has 180 degree rotational symmetry. Um, I've drawn the shapes down here to kind of help us visualize this. So this first one is a rhombus. So I'm just going to change the color here. And um, I'm going to just try rotating these 180. So that's going to be moving my green dot all the way down to the bottom. So I'm going to rotate 180. And we see that the rhombus lands on itself. So that one would be good. That one does have rotational symmetry. And this said just select the answer. So there's only one answer. Um, so that's the answer. But I do want to show you um, on these other ones that they don't have 180 degree rotational. So B is just a trapezoid. So I'm going to rotate this 180 and see that it does not land on itself. We'll do the same for this one. So now this one is an isosceles trapezoid, meaning that these two legs are the same size. So we'll rotate 180, see that that does not land on itself. And then um, the last one, they just wanted any random quadrilateral. So I just made one up. Um, could be anything, but rotate 180 degrees and we will see that again, that one did not land on itself. So the only one of these four options that does is the rhombus. Number five, name a quadrilateral in which the diagonal is also a line of symmetry and explain how you know. Um, so this one could be a square um, or a rhombus. And um, so let me get a rhombus on here. And we know that a square is actually also a rhombus because the rhombus just has the equal sides. And so a square would work for this as well. So either of these two shapes is fine. Let me just draw in a line of symmetry or a diagonal that's also a line of symmetry. So we know that these two triangles are exactly the same because the diagonal would be equal. So side, side, side would flip that um, kind of back on itself. And um, same thing with the rhombus. So if we did this diagonal, um, we see the top triangle is identical to the bottom triangle through side, side, side. Um, and so then it's just going to flip over on itself or reflect over that line. Number six, we have an isosceles triangle shown here. They tell us a couple of things. We know that this side is congruent to this side. And we also know that um, this line in here is the angle bisector. So this angle is congruent to this angle. So how does Kieran know that AB is the perpendicular bisector? So how do we know that this is also the perpendicular bisector, not just the angle bisector? And um, so we can look at this. Um, AB is in both of these two triangles. So we know that it's the same segment in each triangle. So it's the same. And then that shows us, so if I just kind of redraw this top triangle, we've got this stuff marked. We've got this and this equal in the other triangle as well as this angle. So we know that the two triangles are congruent um, by side angle side, which means that if those two triangles are congruent, now we know that this piece is congruent to this piece because of the corresponding parts. So once we know the triangles are congruent, we know their parts are congruent. So that would mean that B is definitely the midpoint. So it is bisecting it. So that proves the bisector part. And then to get the fact that it's perpendicular, you've got a couple of options. So we know it's perpendicular because um, <clears throat> A is equidistant from both C and D. So we know that A is on the perpendicular bisector. Okay, so we know that that blue line would be the perpendicular bisector um, since A is equidistant from C and D. So that's one way you could say it. Another way you could, could look at this is you know that this angle here and this angle here are equal to each other since they're corresponding parts. And we know that a straight line is 180 degrees. So if those two angles are equal, then they both would have to be 90. That would also give us perpendicular. All right, then um, number seven says, in the figures shown, F and G are parallel. So these two lines are parallel. 
select all of the angles that are congruent to angle one. So we know that angle one is congruent to itself. So certainly that is true, okay? Because it's gotta be congruent to itself. That's called reflexive property. Um, angle two, not necessarily equal to angle two. Those two are equal to 180. Um, so not guaranteed to be equal to each other. Angle three, same story. Those two together make a straight line. So they would add up to 180. So they're not gonna be equal to each other. Angle four, okay, so angle four would be equal to angle one, and that's from vertical angles. And you can also think about if you reflected this angle over this angle bisector. So if we had a line here and we reflected this, it would um, land on itself. You could also think of rotating this 180 degrees around that center and those two angles would be identical to each other as well. So angle one is congruent to angle four. Angle five, so if we think about translating these angles down, um, angle one and angle five are identical. So they would be corresponding angles and land on each other. So certainly equal to each other. Um, and then if I just kind of leave this here, then angle one would not be equal to angle six because they would equal 180. If one is equal to five and five and six are on a straight line, then one and six would have to equal 180. And same with seven. Okay, so not equal to angle seven. So we would know again, <clears throat> angle one is equal to angle five by corresponding and then five and seven are next to each other. So one and seven would be 180 instead of equal to each other. And then angle eight um, would be true because angle one is equal to angle five by corresponding and then five and eight are vertical. So definitely eight would be equal to that. And I'm just gonna write out this little justification. So angle one is equal to angle five um, by corresponding angles. And then angle five is equal to angle eight by vertical. So angle one would have to equal angle eight.